I believe if you're going to criticize the creative content of others, bring a creative solution to the table with you. While this video analyzes certain aspects of Sonic's gameplay, I do not claim to be an authority on game design. I only mean to present creative ideas to a problem I recognize in a struggling franchise. Dear Sega, my name's Javid. I work as an animator for a creative studio in Sydney, Australia. I'm also a game design graduate and develop small-time games on the side. In this video, I'll be presenting my case for redesign for one of your most enigmatic franchises, Sonic the Hedgehog. It's no secret that your Sonic has seen brighter days. As I'm sure you're very aware, you don't have to look far to find an opinion or article from writers explaining why they don't like your games anymore. To be honest, they aren't inaccurate. But what I haven't seen are creative suggestions on how to remedy what seem to be holes in the vision for Sonic. And this is what I want to do here. I want to look at the cold hard data and present a creative solution for a redirecting, if you will, of your mascot. Before we go further, I think it's important that we look at your sales and your ratings and take a look at how your platforming rival Mario is tracking as well. So here is a graph of your sales to date in millions, telling us that Sonic 2 on the Genesis has been your highest success in terms of units sold, coming in at 6 million. Sonic Boom being your lowest at 400,000. Now let's add in Super Mario. I've lined these up by year of release. Without any surprise, Mario's first game, which came out during the very young and ripe age of gaming, owns spot number 4 in the list of best-selling video games of all time at 40 million. His sales fluctuate quite a lot as well, which is completely normal. Now there are a few factors here that aren't accounted for, such as regions of release and also console sales data at the time of the game's release. This does make this data a bit unreliable, but I've put this here so we can start to get an idea of where you're roughly sitting in relation to the most successful platform series. But let's move on to reviews. These are very important in gauging how successful the game was in connecting with your audience. So here is a graph of Sonic's reviews according to GameRankings.com. This tells us that Sonic 3 on the Genesis is your highest ranking game at 89%, while Sonic Boom again is at the lowest at 33%. Now let's add in Mario. What I think is worth noting here is that at the beginning of Sonic's career, each new game was connecting more successfully than the last. Well, it seems Mario in the beginning struggled to find his feet. It's important to state that I think Nintendo established the foundation for compelling platforming before Sonic arrived on the scene. But even so, it's clear that your games were maturing at a promising rate. Now the reason I've been adding in Mario is to show you that as a competitive platform game, he's still connecting with his audience and pulling in huge revenue, especially in this age where the platform game is no longer king of the industry. Mario is doing something right here, and I think it's safe to say, judging by your very low and chaotic shifts in ratings, it's something that hasn't become clear to you yet. This information is telling us that there is a disconnect happening between your games and your audience. And I think I know what it is. So here I will present my ideas while at the same time explaining what I believe are the problems we're fixing. So let's bring in Sonic. First thing to notice is the art style. We're steering away from the 3D models you've been using for the last 17 years and bringing in a more organic aesthetic through paint and water brush. Colors remain relatively the same, but Sonic's lean and a bit more animal, as opposed to your fuller, more attitude-heavy design. He has a backpack symbolizing adventure and his gloves and socks are gone. He's wide-eyed and vulnerable. He's still fast, but isn't cocky about it. In fact, he doesn't have much expression at all. He's a blank canvas. So, while I think the overall spirit and feel for Sonic is there, he's a little bit different. Why? Because he isn't designed to appeal to children. And Sega, this is why I believe your games aren't connecting anymore. You're targeting the wrong demographic. Let me explain. Sonic 1 was released in 91, and this was the ad. Gotta go. Hey guy, you're the first serious gamer I've seen all morning. Check this out, brand new 16-bit Super Nintendo with Super Mario World. Wow! Oh, what's this one? Oh, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog from Sega Genesis. Hey, look at these radical colors, huh? Wow, Sonic's fast, too. No, over here. I like Genesis, and it costs a lot less. Wait, kid, that game I'll there. take Sonic and Genesis. <laughs> I knew that. Sonic the Hedgehog, more action, more speed, Sega Genesis, it's a whole lot more for less. So it's pretty clear that because of the this is cooler approach, this was targeted at kids and young teens between 6 and 15. Judging by those sales and ratings we saw earlier, you pretty much nailed it. Now let's watch an ad from 2014 Sonic Boom. Kitty, come down. Let's rock. I got this. Oh yeah. Don't you do it. I am Cap. Oh no. We're better at 
this in our world. Sonic Boom, Rise of Lyric. You can pre-order now. Cute and slapstick. I say you're still aiming for that same age group. Not that this ad was bad. Sega, here is the main problem. The fanbase you established with the first Sonic game in 91 are now living 24 years older here in 2015. While your original fans who hold you most dear are in their 30s, you're still aiming for that same age group in disregarding your original fanbase. And guess what? Your original fanbase now have jobs with money to buy your games, they now have extensive knowledge of the Sonic universe they will most likely share somewhere on the internet, aka free, positive online publicity. An Australian study held by Bond University shows that the average gamer is 30 years old. So your games are actually going to be played longer and by more people if this is where you're targeting. Not only that, the age group you're aiming for just don't care about Sonic anymore. They're more interested in the next action shooter or sports game. Why? Because it's cool to be playing those games. They don't have an emotional connection with platformers like your older gamers do. Sega, your demographic is here in the 18 to 30 year old bracket. Okay, with this newfound knowledge, we need to bring some maturity into the Sonic universe, and this isn't done through guns and action. It's through strong, compelling gameplay, and a character the player actually enjoys playing as. So let's go back to Sonic's new design. The first thing to go is all voice acting, so any character development will be through movement and animation. So one question we need to ask is, what is his personality in relation to his ability? Sonic is fast, and in the past we've seen him embrace this ability with a too cool for school persona, and this was totally relevant in 91. Now, not so much. We need a character we can grow with. So Sonic's idle stance is a little bit cautious. Like the player, he's a little bit unsure of what lies ahead. He's vulnerable, and this means we are on the journey with him. When Sonic runs, he keeps that cautiousness. Now here is where I want to propose something new. When Sonic jumps, he doesn't become a ball straight away like the original games. A second action like the X button triggers a charge attack and here he is powerful against enemies. Down an X smashes Sonic into the ground, let's call this the body slam. Left or right an X gives Sonic a kind of air dash, while in his basic jump mode he's vulnerable, and this adds a great tension into the gameplay by not making Sonic too powerful. The player is required to use fast finger work and quick thinking. I think the spirit of Sonic is that keep moving approach, and I believe this keeps to that but just in a different way compared to the approach of your most recent games. Which brings me to what I believe is problem number two, the way you're using Sonic's speed. Speed is the identity of the series, and it's moved around a lot, pun intended. The way speed was translated from 2D to 3D had completely changed the way players approached Sonic games. Your fanbase had to learn a different Sonic language, and in the mid 90s when we were being introduced to polygonal graphics, I think most of your fan base were open to that. Personally, I think it's important to evolve, especially in the fast growing world of game design, so I totally respect you for your courage to experiment with Sonic's design. However, without needing to elaborate on the subject that some of your experiments were horribly unpolished, you haven't arrived yet at a platform where Sonic's speed can thrive in a 3D environment. You've tried auto runners, you've tried slowing him down, you've turned him into a hedgehog version of a werewolf. You've added a combat system and even taken that away, and you've tried making him even faster. After all these years and these different attempts, I believe we're left with something without an identity. What is a Sonic game? I think it's time you realised that Sonic's speed thrived best in a 2D landscape. What helps me to make this point is Sonic Generations, released in 2011. Your highest ranking console game in 10 years, with 79%. Not only did you give a small nod to your original fanbase in the nostalgia, you gave Sonic only two dimensions to play with, for 50% of the game at least. So I believe the best way to use Sonic's speed isn't necessarily in a fast manner, but more so in a momentum based system where the player determines how fast or slow they wish to proceed. Now let's talk about rings, a Sonic staple. Collecting 100 rings gives you a life and acts as a sort of shield when you take damage. I think I'd go so far to say the concept of limited lives is, ironically, dead. This is a very broad statement, but excluding Mario, most of the best modern platformers have taken the concept of lives out of the picture. I suggest we do the same. We want the player to proceed in your game. This does make rings a bit useless, but here I want to present a totally new concept to the core gameplay in Sonic. Referencing again the survey held by Bond University, the most popular gaming genre across all ages is, surprisingly, puzzle games. 
with first-person shooters and action games close behind, platformers being the least popular. I think you know this, which is why you've tried to blend genres by bringing in slower puzzle-based sections in your latest game. I say puzzle here very hesitantly. The definition of a puzzle is a problem designed to test ingenuity or knowledge. Like a jigsaw, we have all the pieces, but it's the question of how those pieces fit together that generates the problem. And there's a great feeling that comes when the solution finally clicks in the mind of the player. This is compelling gameplay. In Sonic Boom, however, our ingenuity and knowledge aren't being tested. Without spending too long on this, pushing buttons in a linear progression to proceed is not considered a puzzle, or even interesting gameplay. The button is there, and we press it. There's no need for this to exist, and it comes across as a cheap way to create an ebb and flow in momentum. So here I have an idea, which I believe solves our ring problem and our puzzle problem at the same time. Remember those amazing power-ups you had in your highest ranking game Sonic 3 and Knuckles? I want to bring them back, but also connect the collection of rings with them in a currency sort of fashion. If you press the Y button, Sonic opens his backpack and you see the four power-up boxes. 50 rings essentially buys you one of these power-ups and you bring it out into the world. Invincibility, fire, lightning, and the water shield. Not only do they give their respective protection, but we can bring in creative ways to use them in simple puzzle scenarios. And the important thing here is, we have all the jigsaw pieces. You could find a secret area with a road of spikes. The only way over them is you bring out an invincibility box, and this leads to a hidden collectible. You could have puzzles where you need to keep a button pressed down to hold a door open. Enemies could even use them. You could finish a boss by forcing him to open a lightning box, but the shield brings out a bunch of spikes that destroys the ship. This completely expands options for level design, the way Sonic interacts with his environment, and also adds huge replayable value, while at the same time, giving the collection and protection of rings some weight. Sega, this is just one creative solution, but the bottom line is this. Respect the intellect of the player. Do we want to push buttons placed in front of us just to kill time? I don't think so. Now let's talk briefly on this last subject, the story. With no voice acting to guide us, story will be told through animation and suggestion. Which is fine, because we don't need everything over explained for us and we don't need a complex storyline to keep us compelled. The maturity is all in the gameplay. But that said, we do need a reason to press the forward button. So let's look at the opening cutscene for your most successful game, Sonic 3. Okay, that was over in about 20 seconds. In this cutscene, we meet all the important characters, we establish who our enemy is, and we are given a motive for progressing through the game. And this is all that's needed. Sega, keep the story simple and give the player a simple motive. Okay, with that said, let's look at a brief overview of the new design. We've established that your target audience is now adults and no longer children. We bring Sonic back into two dimensions, we remove all voice acting, and we shift Sonic's appearance to feel more vulnerable. A new moveset is introduced, which adds great momentum-based gameplay. And we've introduced a new game mechanic through the backpack and power-ups, which opens up huge gameplay possibilities and replay value. Sega, this all comes from a place of love for Sonic. The very first game I owned was Sonic 1 on the Master System, and I fell in love with gaming instantly. Your mascot made me love games and art, and it's been hard to see your franchise get crushed into the dirt. Even if you don't take any of this on board, I hope you are very intelligent with how you approach your next Sonic game. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. Love Javid.